Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this new series on the Trinity from the Old Testament. This is Al-Fadi. And uh, if you've watched the introduction to this particular series, you would have noticed that myself and uh, my brother Anthony Rogers, who is with us here in studio, and thank you uh, for joining us, uh, we gave kind of like uh, an overview about uh, why is it important, for instance, to survey the doctrine of the Trinity from the Old Testament. Today, Lord willing, we are going to begin to take a journey through different passages from the Old Testament to begin to show you clearly the members of the Trinity and how they were being described in the Old Testament. Some passages, by the way, will have all three members. Others might have two. Some will have one. And you'll begin to see how even the description of each one of them might vary from one place to the other. But it's very clear that we're talking about a person and that this person is divine and has divine prerogatives and so on and so forth. With that says, Anthony, I think you said we wanted to start today with a passage from Isaiah 63, starting from verses 7, going all the way to uh, verses, I believe, 14. Uh, 14. Yes. Yeah, and actually, so let me say something here about the text overall. Uh, th this text is it has a lot of significance for a number of reasons, but uh, just to highlight a few things. In, in context, Isaiah is looking at Israel's condition which pales Correct. by comparison to what was true in the past. Now Israel is experiencing divine chastisement because of her rebellion against the Lord. And so what Isaiah is doing in this passage is he's looking back to the Exodus and he's, he's recounting the former glories of Israel, the goodness of God to Israel, and he's saying, what has become of us, right? This is what God did for us in the past and here we are now. And he's, he's not only looking to the past, but he's longing for God to do in the future what he did for them in the past. Yeah. And so when we look at this passage and see what it tells us God did at the time of the Exodus and realize that Isaiah is praying for God to do this again for Israel in the future, Amen. It, it becomes really significant. We now realize if, if he's talking about the Trinity here, for example, then it shouldn't be surprising when we come to the New Testament right. and see this hope realized. God has returned to his people. And, and Isaiah 63 and 64 in particular are really amazing because he calls God clearly, you are our father. Mm. You know, and in fact, he wishes even that you will spread the heavens open and you will come down. You know, I mean, it's like all of these kind of like, uh, you know, prophecies, if you wish, but also uh, desires, you know, that uh, the glory of Israel will be restored back to uh, uh, how it used to be because their relationship with God, of course, have been damaged. And technically, this is... Uh, a part of the letter uh, that Isaiah wrote, or the um, you know the book of Isaiah, where he's talking about after the exile have already been fulfilled. Right. So with that says, let's take a look at uh, the first part of this in Isaiah 63 verses 7 to 8. What what is it that we can highlight here, for instance? Well, so first of all, it's clear that verses uh, 7 through 8 are talking about the Father. Right. It says, I shall make mention of the loving kindnesses of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has granted them according to his compassion and according to the abundance of his loving kindnesses. For, he said, surely they are my people, sons, who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior. That's right. And another all that, I want to highlight the fact that God has no problem calling people sons. That doesn't make him their physical father. Right, right. <laughs> so so it, it, it does show that uh, at least here, God is conceived as the father of his people. The savior of Israel is their father. Correct. Right. So let's go ahead and then uh, take a look at the uh, next one, which is Isaiah 63, 9 to 10 now. Yeah, now it becomes... Uh, really interesting because it, it in the previous verses it's talking about God becoming their savior but now it starts to tell us how he did that and so in verse 9 it says in all their affliction he was afflicted now people who are familiar with the exodus should recognize this language this comes from exodus 3 this is when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush right mm -hmm. it says that God heard their affliction in exodus 3 and so he's come down now to answer their cries That's right but if you pay close attention to Exodus 3, you'll know that the one who appeared to them in the bush and identified himself as God 
is the angel of the Lord. That's what it says in Exodus 3, 2. Amen. And so this is important right here. Of course. Right. Yeah. So it says here, in all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. Now, just that language is itself an indication that we're not dealing here with a created angel. This is a mistake that people often make. In Hebrew, the word angel doesn't necessarily refer to one of the created heavenly hosts. With with wings or whatever, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that's what it means, but the word itself just means messenger. It's used to refer to human messengers, mm -hmm. angelic messengers, and even for God in certain passages, which we'll see later in the series. But here we already have an indication that this is not a created angel. He's referred to as the angel of his presence, and he is the one by whom God is responding to the affliction of his people and saving them. So if we go back to the, the verses, it, it not only mentions the angel, but it goes on to say, in his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. There's the word redeemed again. We, remember, we saw that in the last episode. And then it says, and he lifted them and carried them all the days of old, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. So now we have the introduction of the Spirit. God saved mm -hmm. Israel at the Exodus by means of the angel of his presence and his Holy Spirit. So here we have the other member of the Trinity. And of course, we've already been talking about God, you know, uh, the Father, and he was afflicted. The angel of his presence, that's the second, you know, member now being mentioned. And then you have the Holy Spirit as the third member. And, you know, really this, as we progress throughout the series, will become more and more clear. For instance, the angel of his presence at some point is also known the angel of the covenant. And right. you tie that, of course, to Exodus chapter 23, verse 20, or to Judges chapter 5. I mean, so hopefully people are taking notes. Like you said, they need to go back and watch it more than once. And slowly and gradually, the big picture will become so exciting. Exactly. So here, I just want to highlight one more thing before we uh, conclude this episode. But as we go uh, to the next several verses, uh, starting in verse 11. So we'll go to uh, the, the next one, uh, for instance, uh, verse 11. Yeah. So, so remember, in, in the previous verses, it says that he, the Father, redeemed and saved Israel by means of the angel of his presence and his Holy Spirit. Well, here it mentions those two persons again, but I want you to notice how the title changes. So let's read those verses. It says in verse 11, then his people remembered the days of old of Moses. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses? who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name. So here, uh, the the angel of the Lord is now referred to as his glorious arm. That's right. This is the one right here that you're referring to. So that's, a, that's another way of saying the angel of the Lord or the angel of his presence or the angel of the covenant, if you wish. Right. Yeah. And, and, and as we'll uh, see throughout the series, uh, this, this term ultimately is associated with the Messiah. But let, let's just look at a few more slides to see this, this term used in the Old Testament. You'll see it's not just – sometimes when people – well, the Old Testament itself sometimes uses this phrase just as a figure of speech. It's just referring to an exercise of God's power. But there are other times when it's clear that it's being used as a divine title. Right. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord uh, together with the arm of the Lord uh, is a reference to more than one person. Uh, but actually, go to the next slide and uh, – and this is where, notice what it says here. This is Isaiah 30, verse 30. It says, The Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard, and the descending of his arm to be seen in fierce anger, and in the flame of a consuming fire in cloudburst, downpour, and hailstones. Here you have this interesting expression that people are going to see the descending of God's arm. Now, this verse by itself may not you know, force a person to the conclusion that we're talking about a person here, but it at least is suggestive, right? You, you don't norm, normally speak this way 
uh, about an arm, you know, the descending of the arm being right. seen and, and these uh, supernatural things attending his appearance. Uh, but go to the next slide and it becomes even clearer. So, I mean, it's, it, it's fair to say that the descending of his arm and to be seen, it's almost like we're talking about a person. Right, right. We're not really talking about an arm, you know, coming down, you know, right. but, but a person. And this is, of course, uh, how God speaks to us sometimes in a way that makes sense to us because we won't be able to really comprehend what that means. And right. in, in an instance like this, you know, obviously the Lord is trying to, uh, you know, uh, communicate with us in a way that is easier for us. So, so let's take a look at Isaiah 40. Right. So here, yeah. notice it says, Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Again, that's not the way you refer to an arm. That's right. Right. And so it, that's why I say when you look at these passages, sometimes – they're suggestive. You're thinking that may not just be a figure of speech. It might be a title for someone. And this passage is, is even clearer than the former passage. That's right. That's right. right? So, so here his arm is going to rule for him. Uh, people will recognize this language elsewhere from Isaiah uh, where, where God talks about looking and seeing no one uh, to, to, to stand in the gap between him and sinful creatures. And so God is appalled at this, and then he says, so his own arm worked salvation for him. So that's another, another uh, reference to this. Uh, but here we see God, it's saying that God's own arm is going to come and rule for him. And so if we move to the next slide, uh, I want you to see how this is associated with a couple of things. We're not going to be able to fully uh, uh, chase this theme out today, but we'll, we'll at least be able to introduce it. But notice here, all the more clearly, the arm of the Lord stands out as a person. Here's Isaiah saying, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. So he's speaking to the arm of the Lord. That's right. And in effect, what he's doing is he's saying, well, it goes on in the text. It says, awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? Okay, so again, Isaiah is addressing the arm of the Lord. And what he's saying is, awake, O Lord, come now, do for us what you did in the past. Namely, uh, the past when you cut Rahab in pieces and dried up the sea. Now, we don't know yet who Rahab is, that might sound strange to people, or the dragon, but notice its association with God delivering them from the sea. Right? This is clearly a reference back to the Exodus, and it's attributing this deliverance to the arm of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And obviously, we'll, we'll notice later. I mean, it's just that I highlighted the word who dried up the sea, and a quick question would be, when did that happen? Obviously, when Moses took the Israelite out of Egypt. Could right. Rahab be Egypt, you know? So, so this is the beauty about the passages. It's like you have to put them together to begin to understand clearly what's going on. Would you like to go to the next one? Well, and that's what I meant, uh, though, by saying that the Bible's a book that's meant to be studied. Uh, somebody just picking up some of these verses will have a lot of questions. They'll be very puzzled. Uh, and a person who's not interested in really chasing down the truth will then start creating uh, curious questions or things that are intended to try and ridicule or, or tear things apart. But those who are actually engaged and interested and sincere and are going to chase these things down will start to see all these connections. They'll find out who Rahab is. That's right. And they'll find out who the dragon is and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it seemed like, you know, uh, uh, in the next episode, we're going to continue now with the same theme uh, f uh, that you have already started it. But, uh, you know, to sum up uh, what we have talked about today is that you begin to see now how the members of the Trinity are being introduced. And as you've seen a couple of times, sometimes all three of them are there. Sometimes one or two of them are there, but the Holy Spirit also is being introduced. And, and here's why this is important, because sometimes you get accusation that, oh, the Holy Spirit is what's only introduced in the New Testament. That's not the case. You look at the Old Testament, there is many passages. By the way, whatever we're showing you is just a sample of many passages in the Old Testament. In other words, don't just take this one and run with it and assume that that's the only lonely passage that we have that can we, prove, uh, we can use to prove something as rich as the doctrine of the Trinity. Brother, thank you so much as always. And I uh, cannot wait now for uh, you know, our next episode to continue digging deeper uh, through the Word of God and begin to 
show uh, those who are watching and sincerely, you know, uh, following uh, what we're doing and hopefully even taking notes how rich the Word of God is and how real this doctrine of the Trinity is, even in Old Testament. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and I pray that uh, you have been blessed by whatever we covered here today and throughout this series, of course, whether what we have covered so far and what will be covered in the future. So have a blessed day until we meet again. Thank you for watching. Please like our video, and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.